Okay, welcome back to IT Security Labs. And my name is Howard. Today, we're going to learn ethical hacking where we'll be completing a machine called ICA. ICA is from Vaughnhub. It's a free machine. And as you can see here, it's a very easy machine. If your goal is to learn ethical hacking, we're going to learn how to abuse a MySQL server. We will find a public exploit. And then we'll do a very interesting privilege escalation in Linux. So please make sure to stick around and watch this video because there is a few things that you will learn. But our main goal here is to infiltrate this ICA machine. It's a play on the FIB. If you have seen Grand Theft Auto 5, it's, you know, these big agencies that they're trying to mention here. And our fo main focus here is to break in, get root access on this system. I've already deployed the machine. And you will notice that right here, when you deploy the machine from Vaughnhub, it will tell you, hey, by the way, the IP address is 192.168.38.250. Yours might be different. So the first thing that we need to do is run an NMAP scan. Minus SV, minus SC, and 192.168.38.250. And what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, NMAP, go to the machine, scan for service versions. Let us know what versions of services are running and use some default scripts from there and scan this machine here. And what we're doing here, we're saying, let's also do all ports, just like that. And when we hit enter, after a few minutes, you will notice that you get the results that look like this. What we have here is port 22, which is SSH. Usually we don't brute force or do anything with SSH unless if it's going to tell us that the system is really vulnerable. So we will move on to the next port, which is port 80. And right away when I see port 80, I just open a browser all right, since we're visiting port 80, we just enter the IP address and we should see what's running on this system. So I'll copy that while it's loading. It's kind of slow, but that's fine. So I would do a simple derb uh, using the wait list command or text for now. Then going back here, we see that our website actually says, hey, I am QDPM 9.2. And we have an email and password. So it's asking for an email and password. But uh, since it's asking for an email, usually I just skip that part because I cannot make up uh, emails right now. So we just go and check the page source here. In the page source, we don't see anything. We're usually looking for any JavaScript that's being loaded, any comments that people might have been less uh, careful leaving here. But we do have the name of the thing here, QDPM 9.2. So let's use search exploit for that. I'll stop go buster here for now. Let's just use search exploit. QD. All right, so we do did a search exploit QDPM 2.1, and as you can see here, uh, we have a 9.1 though. That's not the same version. <laughs> 9.2, okay. So QDPM 9.2. All right, I don't see anything there. Let's go and search this on Google, just in case my local X search point is not up to date. Uh, see the exact version here, information disclosure from Google. So let's open that from exploit DB. It says, hey, if you use that, it looks like we can see the password to the database right here under call config, whatever that is. So we're going to find out if this actually works for us. And we hit enter there. Oh, looks like it's actually trying to download a YAML file. Let's say open it. All right, so when we open it with Emacs here, we see that it does say MySQL DB name QD, QDPM and the host is local host. Username is this. So let's just copy this whole thing here. All right, so we have a username and password for the database. Let's go check it out. That's the next port here. We have MySQL. So let's sign into this database and see if we can actually uh, access the database. Then if we do, we can dump usernames and passwords. All right, so we need to sign in. We say MySQL minus U QDPM admin. And then the host is 192.168.38.250. We need a password here. Let's see if we can sign in. And it's asking for a password. We save our password from the dump that we just saw using the, the vulnerability. And we're in. All right, so 
now that we're in, the first thing that I like to do is show databases. My SQL. Okay. The database that we need is this one. Was that the one that we are using? Use QDPM, show tables. We have a lot of tables here. I mean, we can look through all these for any information that might be interesting. But right now, I'm just interested in the users. I like to select all from users. So the users is empty. That's interesting. Let's go to show databases again. Let's go to uh, staff this time. Okay, now we can say show tables. This time we actually have a login and a user. So that's going to be interesting. So the database that we need is called staff. Okay, select all from login. It looks like we have password hashes and with these two equal signs here, they are MD5 hashes. So I'm just going to copy these and paste them on the side here. All right, let's do a select all from user. We also have um, users and their positions. It looks like they're all interesting. So we have Smith, Lucas, and everybody. I'll just copy these as well and save them to a file. So I have users at their MD5 hashes. So I just need to decode these MD5 hashes. Okay, so this is what I store from the database. I just put it in a nice to uh, view here. So we have user IDs. Hopefully these ones match, but we don't we don't really care. We have these base 64 hashes. Let's see if we can just decode all these hashes at once and then uh, find what the passwords are. So what we can do is copy all these and save them in a file. vi hash dot text set paste them in there All right so if i do a catch hash dot text we get this i did try to do a simple while loop here to see if i can uh, decode it it's decoding everything so there's a simple thing that i need to do but i'm too lazy right now i'm just going to decode them since i only have five i'll just copy and paste and decode them all on this side here but you can automate this in bash and as you can see this is the first password that's the first password do the second one i mean it's faster this way instead of trying to figure out why my for loop is not working but of course you can go and figure out quickly why this for loop is not working if anyone is interested this is the while read loop that i had and I hope it. I was hoping it would work. I spent a couple minutes trying to get it to work, but it's giving me all the gibberish. So it's probably just a matter of character numbers here. But I'm just going to decode each and every one of them individually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I got five passwords that have been basic for decoded, and five users. I don't know which user and password go together. So I'm just going to create vi pass text i'm just going to put those passwords in here user.text and for the user.text i'm just going to put um the users so i got passwords and i get users now i just need to figure out where can i use this and that brings us back to our nmap results we know that we have a bunch of other services here, just 22 in this time. So let's brute force SSH. It's a very, going to be a very simple uh, brute force for us. We're just going to use Hydra here, passing the password.txt and the user.txt uh, files. And we use Hydra. I um, think it's minus L for user.txt, then minus P, pass.txt. So we want to brute force SSH on 192.168.38.1. .1, .1, 
the 250 and I would like to force that let's see if this actually does work we don't usually brute force but in this case we are actually going to because we have a user list and we have a password list and I'm not sure which user goes with which password okay so it says it finished here okay so the first time Hydra did, it did not find anything let's do this uh, ls bi user dot text maybe this is not necessary I should have just randomized this Locus M, Locus D, T, L. You always want to think about these cases. Because just because it didn't find anything with the uppercase doesn't mean that it won't find with lowercase. So let's try it again. All right, it looks like we did. So make sure to remember to change your case and your usernames there because. As you can see, I found um, Travis this time. So I'm going to sign in as Travis. SSH Travis 68.38 250. Uh, yes. It's asking for a password. All right, so we're in as Travis. Okay, so since we're in as Travis, one thing that I remembered about Hydra from last time I've used it to brute force SSH is that it actually stops checking other passwords once one matches. So it matched for Travis. So what I would like to do is go to vi user dot text and delete Smith, Lucas, and Travis because we haven't brute forced Dexter and Maya yet. That's something very important to know. Once Hydra matches one entry, it will stop, and you need to make sure that you test the rest of them. So I will actually do that right now. Rerun Hydra again, just in case the other two did not get a chance to be tested. And in this case, I know because, as you can see, now we found Dexter as well. So remember, when you are running Hydra this way, that if it matches and you are not done with your list, you might need to delete something. So we also have Dexter and this one. So I'm going to sign in as Dexter as well. I'm going to have two SSH sessions. 192 to 168. Yes. Pseudo minus L. Can I run anything with pseudo privileges? That's what I do first. Is Dexter? No, I cannot. What about is Travis? So Travis password was this one. Let's paste it. Right, so not, nobody can run anything as sudo. That's okay. But we find a user.txt here. All right, so we found the first flag in Travis. ls minus la catch dot bash history. In the bash history, there's a su root. Wouldn't that be nice? I know we don't have anything for root here, so it's not going to work. All right. So, same for the Dexter account. LS minus LA. Okay, this time we see a profile and note to text. Okay, it seems to be that there is a weakness while accessing file system. As far as I know, the contents of executable files are partially viewable. This is good. I need to find out if there is vulnerability or not. Executable files are usually have uh, SUID binaries with them. Okay, so since we are looking for ex executables, we can go back. In my notes here, I can just look. This is the command that you can use to look for binaries on the system that is the SUID bit set. And when an SUID bit is set, you can run the command as whoever owns the file. In this case, opt get access here. That is a, not a normal file on the Linux system. So that's interesting and it's owned by root. If this can be abused, we can run this as 
ourselves and it will elevate our privileges. So if we run strings on that, what we are looking for is any commands that is running as Linux. So any system commands like cat, uh, echo, ls, they're always interesting. That's what you're looking for. In this case, we see that it's actually running cat root system info, which is a big mistake because if you look at that command, it's just running cat without specifying the correct location. It's just saying, hey, run cat command. So that means that we can abuse this and actually take over the system. And this brings us to the easiest privilege escalation method that you can ever see in Linux. If you say um, echo dollar sign path, the path says, hey, we started at user local and we go to this. So when the system is looking for, say, the command echo, it will start looking for here. Hey, do you have the command echo? If it's not there, it will move on to user bin. If it's not there, it will move to bin and so forth until it finds the command. So since we're running the cat command without a full path to where it's supposed to be located, we can actually make our own cat command. In this case, I'm saying I want you to say bin bash. And this will be in my temp folder. So what's going to happen is since the binary that is running as root is calling cat, it will call my cat. And my cat is going to ask to have bin bash spawned. That's all we, we do. So I can say export port path to be equals to. I'd like you to start a such TMP because I want my temp to run first. Remember, Linux will start from left to right looking for any binaries. So if it's looking for the command cat, it will run this one first. So it will start from temp, then uh, dollar sign path. Now if I echo my path, it's actually starting from my temp folder. So what this means is I should now be able to just go and rerun the binary. And if I do that, it will give me root access because I'm asking it to give bin bash and in here there's a cat command. Watch what happens. Okay, so it didn't work. Okay, what did I do? Bin bash such temp cat. Okay, what I didn't do here, <laughs> my mistake is I did not make this an executable. I need to make sure that it's an exec exec executable. Okay, now let me run it again. And look what happened. It's now root. So I should be able to say cd such root and ls. And here is root.txt. So we have owned this system. If you like this type of material and you like to learn, please let me know. Otherwise, this was a very easy machine. And we've done this so many times on this channel. Subscribe and learn with me. Otherwise, I hope to see you soon. Thank you.